In this lecture, I want to begin the discussion of diffusion. Uh, and we're going to start by just defining it and talking about some mechanisms. So let's first begin and just ask the question, what is diffusion? Well, it's simply a process that uh, by which material is going to be transported uh, in some sort of a series of atomic jumps. Uh, it amounts to the migration of atoms from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. I imagine that you've seen diffusion um, many times in your life, usually probably within liquids, um, right? You probably think of it maybe as um, you know, putting dye into water and watching the dye spread out, for example. Um, well, it turns out in, in the cases of uh, gases and liquids, uh, diffusion occurs via Brownian motion, which is sort of the, the random motion of fluid particles. But uh, typically in, in fluid and gas flows, the primary mode of transport is convection, not diffusion. But in solids, in contrast, um, the flow of material can only occur via diffusion. So how, what does it look like? So what I'm showing you here is on the left side is, is called this material A, and the right side here will have material B. And uh, we'll, we'll plot the concentration profile. So this is just uh, the concentration profile in space on the x direction and the concentration percentage on the y. So the, this peach color is for this uh, atom A, and you can see that it's 100% atom A at this location. And uh, in the case of atom B, at this location, it jumps right at this interface and then is 100% elsewhere. If we bring those together and there's any sort of um, time or temperature uh, uh, present, then over time what happens is that those atoms diffuse into each other. Okay, so you start getting some migration of this peach colored atom into the the atom B region and some atom uh, atom uh, uh, atom B type atoms are moving into the at the original domain of atom A and your concentration profile begins to look like this. So that it's still predominantly atom B in, in the right hand side and atom A in the left, but at that interface they're they're starting to diffuse across. Okay. So that's, that's what it is. That doesn't tell you why or how or anything like that, but that's what it is. Okay. Uh, so if the diffusing atoms, so in this case, I gave you two atoms, A and B, if they're of a different type, then we refer to that type of diffusion as interdiffusion or impurity diffusion. Okay. Uh, in contrast, if the atoms are of the same type, we call that self-diffusion. I know that's a little bit um, strange. You probably don't think of um, self-diffusion as happening, but it, all it means is that atoms are moving around in the in the material, uh, and it does happen. So, uh, so those are the two types of diffusion that uh, that can exist. Okay. Now let's talk about how how an atom goes from one position to the other. So one mechanism that we're going to talk about here is vacancy diffusion. But before we talk about that, I want to just ask the question, what, what's required for diffusion to exist and to happen in the first place? What do we need for an atom from, to move from one site to another? Okay. And this is hopefully just a little bit of straightforward logic. First, whatever site it wants to move to has to be available. It needs to be empty, right? And the second is that the, this is a little less obvious, but if an atom wants to move from one site to another, it's going to have to break the bonds that it already has at one site, move to the next site, and then reform those bonds. Okay, so that there, there's going to be an energy required to do that. That's called the energy barrier or the activation energy. Uh, that's that's the energy it must overcome to break its bonds and move to a new site. And the energy that it needs to do that is going to be the thermal energy or the vibrational energy of the atom. So we need enough thermal energy to, to actually allow the atoms to diffuse. Um, what you hopefully are thinking is that well, maybe diffusion is a temperature dependent process. And, and it is. We're going to talk about that in future lectures. Okay, so now let's talk about one mechanism by which this can happen. And that's vacancy diffusion. All vacancy diffusion is, is it's an atom jumping to a vacant lattice site. Or conversely, you can think of it as a vacancy jumping to an occupied lattice site. Uh, sometimes that's easier because vacancies almost always have an occupied lattice site to jump to, whereas 
frequently an atom won't have any unoccupied lattice sites or vacancies to jump to. So um, sometimes it's convenient to think of it via uh, as a vacancy moving. But let's see what happens. So this is just a kind of a three-stage uh, process. So here's here's two types of atoms again. We'll call these peach ones atoms atoms A and the gray ones atoms B. Uh, what there, let's suppose there's a vacancy right here. So this peach atom can jump into this vacancy location, right? So now this peach atom resides here and the vacancy now resides here. We could have thought of that as well as the vacancy jumping to this location, right? There, that's an equivalent statement. Now, this peach atom could jump down into this vacancy site, which it does here. And then finally, now this uh, atom B could jump into this new vacancy site. And you can see that that now gets one atom of atom B into this domain of A and one atom from domain A into domain B. That kind of gives you a, a very um, horses and duckies kind of explanation of how diffusion happens. This is one mechanism called vacancy diffusion. As you would expect, this mechanism requires the presence of vacancies. Um, but remember, vacancies are always present. We talked about that when we talked about point defects, right? They're equilibrium defects, so we can always expect that they'll exist. So there will always be vacancies around, so diffusion should be able to happen given uh, sufficient thermal energy. Okay, how about another uh, uh, diffusion mechanism? It's called interstitial diffusion. So as you could see, the in the vacancy diffusion case, we were mostly interested in uh, atoms that would reside at the lattice sites. In contrast, in the interstitial case, it's the mechanism by which interstitial atoms migrate from one interstitial position to an adjacent interstitial position. So this is a little bit easier to visualize. If this is my atom sitting in an interstitial and it wants to move to this interstitial site, it just moves there. Right, still has to overcome potentially an activation energy, um, still be temperature dependent and the likes, but uh, that's the process. So this is a little bit easier to visualize. Okay, typically interstitial diffusion is going to occur for small atoms that are going to be easily fit into those interstitial locations. So think uh, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Those are the kinds of atoms that you'll frequently see diffusing in an interstitial fashion. Something else that you might note is that Unlike in the vacancy case where if an atom wanted to move, it needed a vacancy beside it. And if you remember from your homework set, vacancy concentrations are relatively small. Uh, you know, 99% of the atoms or more are not going to have a vacancy anywhere near them. So in contrast, most interstitial sites are available, right? So uh, as a result, we're going to have interstitial diffusion that's going to occur much more rapidly than vacancy diffusion because... Uh, number one, interstitial atoms are smaller and more mobile, but also because there's so many more interstitial positions available that there are vacancy positions. Um, and so, um, so, so we can, uh, sort of when we're thinking about the rates, the relative rates, uh, those will be uh, critical features. Okay. Let's go ahead and give two examples now where we might use diffusion directly in processing. So, I'll tell you right now that diffusion is going to be a critical feature for a lot of the heat treatment heat treatments that we'll be talking about and the the procedures that we're going to use to um, to to create microstructures and things like steel. But um, the, the two I want to talk about today are are directly using diffusion to make something. So let's let's talk about this first case of uh, carburization or sometimes called case hardening. And and all this is is that we want to diffuse carbon atoms into iron in this case right and, and it's going to create a surface concentration of carbon in the iron that's higher than it is elsewhere in the material okay so the outer surface is going to be selectively hardened hopefully you remember carbon's uh, atoms exist interstitially in, in iron and so this is an example of interstitial diffusion um, the additional carbon atoms uh, in part make the the iron or the steel harder so think when we talk about hardness think of strength okay so it prohibits yield right um and and what the result is is that the outer surface is going to be selectively hardened okay so in this case i'm showing you a gear why do we do this well when we harden that outside of the material it improves the wear resistance of the gear um but 
But it also, it in part, does this by uh, inducing residual compressive surface stresses. Right? If I if I put a bunch of additional atoms in the surface, I'm actually going to potentially put the surface in compression, which is a, a uh, which is exactly what you want to do to minimize fatigue wear. Um, so you, you might ask the question, well, why don't we just make the gear from whatever steel we want? The problem is, is that you want to be able to, to machine this, right? So you want something that can be easily machined or relatively easily machined, but still be very wear resistant, right? So be nice if you could create your part from a softer material and then at the very end, harden the parts of that um, component that, that you are going to see the most wear. That's kind of what case hardening does for us. Okay. Let's talk about a, another uh, pro, uh Another um, example of using diffusion directly, uh, it's the doping of semiconductors. And I've talked about doping before, and I'll remind you, it's just the diffusion of very small concentrations of impurity atoms. In this case, I'm showing you aluminum uh, into a, a semiconductor like silicon. And we do this for the control of, of electronic properties. So what I'm showing you in this first uh part of the procedure is that we would deposit uh, some aluminum rich layers on the surface of silicon. Okay. That's what these, um, these, these, uh, blue or purple, uh, areas are showing. We heat it up, which is going to allow the aluminum to diffuse into the silicon. And the result is what we would call doped silicon. So now you can kind of see that they have these, uh, regions where, uh, they're aluminum rich. And if we look at an SEM image of a real uh, integrated circuit, we can see that. So uh, SEM stands for scanning electron microscope. So that's what we're using here. Uh, and so this is this is the image of the chip. And then you can you can sort of light different features up here. Uh, in this case, the light regions are the silicon atoms in the second uh, image. And then you can see that if we have the inverted view, now the light regions are the aluminum atoms. We put those aluminum atoms there uh, by diffusion. Okay, so those are two examples that directly use diffusion uh, in processing. But I will just say that we're going to use it extensively for other things as well. Would we want to form particulates or different phases? Diffusion is going to play a critical role. So we're going to use it a lot. But but uh, right now, this is just kind of a high level overview of what it is, how it happens. Um, we'll dig into the the mathematics of it here. Uh, in the upcoming uh, lectures.